my first term at Westminster. The first term at Westminster. Yeah. Um, when I was then <coughs> commuting from my parents' house in Putney on mm. the tube every day, um, and uh, I was in a class in Mr. Washington, and, and um, so I enjoyed I enjoyed the feeling of being being in London. But again, it was a, a house with a sort of a day boy, even though it was a day boy house with a structure of prefects and so on. I was soon in the sort of thick of sort of I don't know fighting and arguing, and I um, I found myself pushing on a door <laughs> with three other boys, and the other and not knowing the other side of the door was the prefect and all the prefects. <laughs> <laughs> and then we and then we sort of released quickly, and all the prefects tumbled in lying on the floor. <laughs> this was not not a good beginning to sort of. So I was given various sort of hard tasks to clean all the sort of college silver over the weekend or something, mm. and, uh, and bullying, and a bit of bullying. Mm. But, but no, despite this, in fact, I was rather ill, and uh, as I was just saying, uh, I then went into hospital for the first four weeks at the Queen Square Hospital, um, where, there, where there were all sorts of cases. Um, one of the most extraordinary cases was this boy who came in who had obviously had some terrible thing in his brain, and at night, shouting, they're changing guard at Buckingham Palace, you know, uh, uh, the A.A. Mill thing. And everybody used to shout, shut up, shut up, you know, until finally the doctors had to come in and, 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 and hit and punch it and give him, give him a great big injection. And used to hear, they're changing guards. And <laughs> anyway, but um, I was, it was very new technology then. They were able to uh, put, give me a number puncture and a myelogram uh, and put me on, a, on, a, on an x-ray tape quite uncomfortable and go up and down to nearly vertical and then you could see on the x-ray this kind of white like a white nile which is your spine in the middle of it is a big black hole which is a tumor uh, all of which was shown 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 to me um, so one of the 13 and and then the, and then they said well you know we're going to try and get that out and, and but they didn't tell me what they told my parents was that you know there's only a certain chance of being able to get it out, and if we don't get it out, you know, we're going to die. You know? um, they just told me we we're going to try and get it out. Um, and um, so it was very difficult for my parents. And, uh, and then I, I went to another hospital where, it was, where I had this surgery, uh, and they did get it out. And I was obviously very fortunate because it was on the outside of the spinal column. And, um, but the point was, this is, this is, this is the big boy in my terrible pain because it's been pressing on the nerve. The way so, uh, so then I was in a ward then with, with extraordinary sort of veterans of, uh, of, 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 of DF who sort of taught me terrible stories through the night. Of, um, and then there were sort of working class lorry drivers, you know, who told me this also extraordinary story in their life. And, and the, the, this lorry driver, his last day in the hospital before he was discharged was to clean his teeth one last time and take the toothbrush and throw it out the window. So I haven't cleaned my teeth for 20 years and I'm not going to clean my <laughs> teeth for another 20 years. <laughs> And, but but it, what was so tra traumatic for me was having had this operation, I then couldn't lift my head. Um, and so they said, well, you've got to start again, because we've taken all the muscles from your back, you've got to develop your muscles. So I, I su I'm supporting my neck today on my side muscles here, and not on the muscles on the back of my neck, because they were all taken mm. away. Um, so I quickly developed quite a large neck as I was sort of you know, expanding this. But again, it was... Um, it, it, I think living with, 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 with people and understanding and talking with them was, was, mm. a, was, a, was, a, was, a, was an experience. And um, you said it le sort of led to your interest in left wing I think politics. it did. I think it did because um, um, always, as, as I've been mentioned to you before, I was sort of, sort of interested in the stories or the aspects of the people who were you know, in a difficult situation. And, um, and this was made, 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 made it more natural. And then, then during, while I was at Westminster, of course, I, when my parents were abroad, I spent so much time with my, with my um, aunt Peggy Jay, my mother's, my mother's sister. And she was married to Douglas Jay, who was in cabinet in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the Labour government in, after 51, and then he joined the Labour Party and the Labour government again in the 60s. So I used to go visit them at Hampstead at the weekend. So we used to talk. She used to talk a bit about labour politics, and I began to sort of, you know, began to sort of um, take a lot of interest in that. And again, at, 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 as a boarder, I don't know whether this is 
who you have said that, that, that um, we used to read a lot of politics, and uh, partly being we used to go down to the House of Commons sometimes, so, and um, it was this was the period of Suez. So for example, Suez uh, 1956 was uh, very extraordinary. Was the listen, listen, listening to listening to uh, first of all the government speech on the radio that we kind of go and attack Suez, and then listening to the leader of the opposition saying, you know, this is a period of war, but normally the opposition supports the government. Absolutely opposed to this, and then hearing in, in then on Fridays at Westminster we were in the course and we had all this sort of military stuff walking up and down, and, and we had the brigade of guards, sergeant majors, shouting at us on Friday afternoon. Hey, Bob! Ah! Bob, 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 Bob. <laughs> very very loud voices, and, and then we'd have lectures about you know when we weren't taking Bren guns apart. You know, on Friday, we used to go to these field trips and we used to learn how to shoot a Bren gun. It's, a, it's an astonishing thing to shooting a big machine gun at mm. 16, 15. I mean, the reaction is astonishing. And then we'd hear about, I, I was actually explaining to this people the other day, the stories of exa exactly what was happening in the Suez War. Or we, we were told about, you know, the fact that the American fleet went in front of the British fleet and said, what do you think you're doing? You know, it was, a, it was an extraordinary event, you know. Um, so we, during my lifetime, you know, we've had, we had Suez. Uh, when, the, when the Americans were against the Brits, and then we had, uh, and then we had uh, uh, Vietnam, where the Brits didn't support the Americans, and we had the Falklands, and then we had Iraq. It's so actually, the studying through the life, you know, there's been these quite, quite, uh, quite big events. Well, that's how that's the perspective I had on it. But, but anyway, we um, so somehow this whole funny place of being at Westminster School with Parliament on the one side, brigade of guards sort of shouting at you on the other <laughs> side, going down and sort of shooting Bren guns on Friday afternoons here. It was, you know, you felt you were, you were part of some, um, some governmental system and, mm. and you were controlling yourself, the world, you know, uh, and, and, and you, were, you were going to be part of all this, you know. Mm. Uh, and and, on, and uh, then we had these uh, sort of uh, political sessions, uh, the political society sessions with, I remember quizzing, there was a curious man called Lord Althorpe who used to write about whether we needed to be a republic or not, so mm -hmm. it was a debate that, and Ted Heath came. But perhaps one of the most interesting moments was when C.P. Snow came, it was fa and, and that it was a very, very uh, uh, interesting event. What he said, he, he said was that, you know, you, all you, you know, us in British, you know, um, are all very narrow, narrow-minded, and uh, I've just been to Russia. Uh, where you know, no Russian physicist uh, would uh, be able to pass his exams unless he could also pass a very detailed written paper on war and peace from the character, write about the character of Natasha in War and Peace or something. It was quite uh, um, striking. Actually, I found it very stimulating. So I sort of quickly thought, my God, you know, I must read my War and Peace of Dostoevsky <laughs> and Austin, and, you know, which mm -hmm. I did. Um, and it was quite. Um, so it was a school. It was a school that made you. Um, feel that you should take an interest and participate and you know you are up to it uh, in, in, all, in all these aspects of public life. And again, one, does, one sees this um, a lot, you know, children, in fact in all countries of the world, children who are not brought up in capital cities feel politics quite alien generally. Mm. And it's only very few children from provinces who actually sort of feel it's natural for them to enter into politics. There's a high proportion, a much disproportionate proportion mm. of children uh, field politics and public affairs are for them if you're brought up in a capital city. So, so um, I mean, Dragons was unusual at Oxford and Cambridge is a bit more of that, but um, so, so that, was a, that was a strong feature. Um, but the other feature of, 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 of being at Westminster really was that I then, I did have some sort of splendid, splendid teachers in, in, um, in particularly in, in mathematics. Uh, I, had, I had a great German teacher called Adolf Prague Very small class. You see, in those days, the, the mathematics sixth at Westminster had four boys in it. There were 27 in classics. You see, uh, now it's the other way around. Mm. Us, and, um, uh, and we had another master who sort of uh, teach us a lot about mechanics um, and physics teachers, and who would sort of spend a lot of time you know, talking to them at school. And uh, it was it was um, it was at that time that I, I became quite. My same class was Dan McKenzie, one of the colleagues, colleagues in, in Kings. And one of the one of the one of the letter moments. Um, I remember you. I 
tell stories about him. I love it. Yes, yeah, sure. but <laughs> one of the better moments was uh, was in the divinity class, uh, which was unusually unusually given by a, a vicar or a canon from the Westminster. So he went out of the class and said, "Who believes in God?" You see, and most boys. This is generally not what you do ask in a divinity class in a public school. So, although we all, of course, went to chapel every day, and it was very beautiful. tremendous aesthetic and you know, probably semi-religious experience. But then actually learning, being asked to sort of talk about uh, the Bible and uh, biblical matters, generally you're not asked to your, to, to, to your particular faith in that part. But anyway, this, on, the, on this occasion we were asked and, 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 and they, most of us hummed and hawed as it were and said, well, we do sometimes and I wonder about this, I'm not quite sure. But then they came to Dan McKenzie and they said, do you believe in God? And Dan said, no! <laughs> so, 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 so the vicar said, why not? He said, because I am a scientist. So we all said, oh, Dan, how can you be so sort of na naive and sort of, you know, mm. big as that? Anyway, he was very emphatic about it. And of course, you know, I, I'm, Dan was quite a friend and we had holidays together later on. Um, but, uh, but we are a very strong group of, uh, of, you, know, of uh, you, know, you know, scientists. Um, and, and uh, already socially, which was which is a, a feature of that school, and it still is a school. You know, the, the scientific bodies are very close together, and mm -hmm. the, the humanities people are. Um, and although we had studies and so on, one was beginning to sort of diverge, you know, you know, beginning to separate into these sort of sub sub groups. But one of the interesting things, looking back on it, to to to, to which which uh, I think when you tell this to people now, they are really surprised at much, is that we were emphatically told that it would be impossible scientists unless you become really fluent in German because this was the 50s you know German German and even when I had uh, as a as an undergraduate I had uh, vacation jobs in ICI they said you've got to learn German you can't, you can't possibly sort of get anywhere in science unless you speak German and understand German and so on and so on um, which of course you know just complete, completely disappeared I mean uh, and in, in the United States in the, in the 60s all graduate students had to learn two foreign languages Many of them tried to learn Russian and German or read it, read it, all of that has now disappeared. So it was, you didn't feel, uh, in a, as a scientist, that uh, being English was, you know, you were the dominant culture, you know, that, which, is quite, which is quite important. Whereas now everybody, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a limitation of, mm. of, of children now that uh, you're English and the English is the dominant culture. Mm. It might not be for forever. Anyway, so Westminster, we, we um, uh, my parents were, um, were, were abroad um, uh, much of the time, and I had one uh, holiday in, in Malaya, and that was a, that was a, that was a tremendous experience, uh, or two holidays in, in Malaya, as it was then called. Um, my father was different the acting missionary. And again, it was, it, this was a period in which there was sort of war going fighting with the, with the Chinese uh, guerrillas. So um, there was a lot of you know, security and arms and, uh, and we had a wonderful my cousin actually was, was in the national service and we learned about that. Um, but it was uh, you know interesting seeing be, you know being in a country that was developing early and going going into, into uh, independence. But I did a sort of student project when I was there but uh, you know, it was so by that time I was 17, mm. I did a project there, one, uh, in which we, I toured around all these villages in, in Malaya, um, um, trying to study how the smallholders were behaving in relative to rubber growers and the changing mm. economy. Um, so I actually found this essay the other day, and I was, I, you know, sort of like, it's a, you know, I suppose I was a model, you know, an article in Economist or something, but it, but it was based upon lots of interviews and studying it. So I was. Well, I think, as you can see, although I was very interested in science, I was very interested in these wider, wider political, political matters and connections uh, together. And obviously, being with my father, um, who was a, who was the British Deputy High Commissioner, we had a lot of deep discussions about that. One of the funniest moments, which I, which I did uh, get, get described in my father's obituary, was this uh, tremendous problem in Malaya. Um, in, in, 
they became independent in August 1957. I was there for the summer holidays. And by July, they still had not got a national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and the, the point was they had had a competition, an mm. open competition for a national anthem. And one of the people who had entered was Benjamin Britten. <laughs> and and, and um, um, so Benjamin Britten had sent in this competition um, about six months earlier uh, to the Prime Minister Tunku Abdulrahman. And uh, my father is a bit, was a very good pianist. Uh, he, was, he played some of them when he was there. And so the Tunku came round to my father's house with sort of outriders and you know, motor bicyclists and so on and asked him, would he play this piece of Benjamin Britten's? So my father and the Tunku, the Prime Minister, sat on my father's piano stool and he played, they played the, uh, the, this draft national anthem. <laughs> and they looked at each other and said, this will not do. <laughs> so, they, so, they, so they then made some suggestions about it might be changed. Can you imagine? And sent this back to Benjamin Britten, who was not amused. <laughs> and, uh, and so there was actually ended up with some quite poor legal case in the Foreign Office of Benjamin Britten as to, as, to, as to how much money he should be paid for this. So anyway, so by, by July there was no answer. So they had this brilliant idea of taking a very popular dance tune and slowing it down. <laughs> and that worked very well. <laughs> but it was a, it was a, quite an occasion there because you know uh, actually the Duke of Gloucester flew out and you know, the Queen, the Queen, present Queen uncle, to hand over independence, and, and his son, who was a, uh, later an undergraduate at Trinity College Cambridge, who sadly died in a plane crash. I, 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 I was sort of friendly with him, so it was quite an occasion seeing the flag. And I hadn't thought of seeing the flag going down or the marching, you know, mm. uh, and so. Having been to India, in fact, my father's career and I've obviously reflected it. You know, you know this, this sort of post-colonial life, you know, mm. post-colonial events, you know, have sort of coloured the sort of world that, world that we've been in. And um, and at that time, it was sort of interesting, really. Um, it was all the kind of somewhat looking backwards, mm. um, and this was the the world of the wars and the empire decay. You know, what was coming next? And, and, and I think I feel, I mean, sort of jumping forwards, you know, I, I sort of, I think more than, more than perhaps many of my colleagues, um, and it's still, re regrettably, I think, many, more than many of my colleagues in my generation, uh, I, I sort of, you know, changed to this tremendous and upward, I mean, sort, of, sort of embracing Europe. I mean, that's, mm. uh, for those of us who have embraced Europe, which is a minority, I would say, intellectually, In a, sort of, in a sort of total way, um, you know, that has been the sort of change in our mm. life. You know, so I've slightly been drawing this picture of looking backwards at Germany and the wars and the end of the empire. But actually, by the time we began to be here in Cambridge in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, the, the European um, adventure, you know, was beginning. And I was a bit of a skeptic to start with, you know, but I think once that's sort of taken off, I think for, for many people that is. But sadly, that is not still the sort of majority sort of view, I'd say, you know, and they haven't embraced this. This is the, you know, the marvelous thing about Bob Britain, we are part of, part of Europe um, in, a, in, a, in a very kind of you know, connected way. You know. um, anyway, but that, but that was sort of, uh, that was Westminster. And, and, um, Can I just uh, yeah. follow up one thing at Westminster? This is uh, Dan McKenzie's No, I Don't Believe in God, and uh, because I'm a scientist. Um, I often ask people about you know, Richard Dawkins and whether science and religion are compatible and so on and, and what their own faith and beliefs are more generally. Yes. Um, how would you place yourself as, as now or over your life? Would you, have you moved away from religion, towards religion, it's all irrelevant or what? Well, no, I'm afraid to say I'm, I'm, I'm a as I sort of was indicating, he's a sort of a semi aesthetic, semi non believer, really, a semi believer, semi semi believer, I suppose. I, I can't quite, I can't accept the bleakness of this, just here we are as, a, as this extraordinary sort of um, event in sort of biochemistry and physics, and, uh, which, which is sort of from one intellectual side of the brain. So I sort of slightly, as it were, I've sort of become a, you know, I suppose, 
intuitive resource systems, a system, an intuitive systems person. I mean, we actually, by going to, ch sometimes going to church, uh, by sometimes having semi-religious social things together, you know, we, 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 we create good feelings about ourselves, we, we, um, we work together better. Um, so the surprising things come out of it for, for ourselves and for our, for our community. Sort of relate to how it was in the past, so it's not a complete. It's not a. It's not an understood, uh, rationally understood um, set of beliefs um, and reactions. But I find that uh, somewhere near where I am. So um, somehow or other, you know, I think we said we said the Lord's Prayer, you know, for 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 sixty years or something it's by saying it again with others. You know, part of something in your past and, and connected. Um, I mean, it, I mean, it probably is not very different from singing the football song of Arsenal uh, because you, you, you've done that for all your life. But I, I, I didn't do that because I did go to church and say the Lord's Prayer, and, and, you know, and that's my Arsenal. But you know, uh, um, I so I you know if you and I so I don't go into it a lot further than that. Um, mm -hmm. I just I just sort of see the alternative. As us as, as, as a set of individuals, and that's why it's sort of too bleak, really. Um, and I find, you know, culturally, we're part of this sort of church, uh, this sort of semi-Christian world, and, and uh, so, like many others, I'm sort of semi-part of it. You know. hmm. Let's let's um, perhaps go on now to uh, Trinity, Cambridge. Um, you presumably uh, entered to do science straight away. Uh, at yes. Why did you go to Trinity? Your father was there, or? Oh, no, no, I went to Trinity. Well, first of all, you know, uh, Westminster had this... So if you're, if you're in the Math 6, I mean, you know, you were progressing from Stevenage to Bulldog to Westminster. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who... You know, that was sort of where you were headed, you know, if you were sort of considered to be plausible. And Trinity had... I mean, Westminster had this connection with Christchurch, Oxford, mm. and that was mainly for classicists. Mm. If you were a scientist, you were sort of headed, uh, headed for, well, for Trinity. That was sort of kind of the way it was. Really. Um, but, uh, but in my case, though, I had a stronger connection because my, uh, my grandfather had been a fellow at Trinity mm. and my um, uncle had been there and, and so mm. on. But my, my, not only my grandfather, but his two brothers had all been at uh, Trinity for the First mm. World War. So, you know, that was sort of where I, where I, where I went to. But, but, but before, I went to, uh, before I went to Westminster, you know, I had this sort of kind of other great sort of social experience of, of having my time out in which I, I worked on a I worked on a building site in Cardiff uh, for, for, for five months um, as a sort of because I got this place to do engineering as a training engineer and that was really an extraordinary experience so I lived I lived in this in a small council house in Cardiff and went down on this sort of uh, track every day I was paid one and So I got eight pounds a week um, for board and lodging and pay, and pay. I was able to save four pounds a week, which was quite extraordinary. Um, but um, so this was a very raw, very cold site there in Cardiff on the docks, and, with, and, and they were building one and so on there. And, 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 uh, um, and, uh, and, all, as, and then you had all these workers coming in, and you saw these extraordinary kind of, you know, super rough, uh, industrial relations. Sort of form of punching people in the nose <laughs> to, kind of, to kind of behave. And so I remonstrated with him. As, as you can see, I was a difficult person. He said, Well, Julian, he said, and this is an American, I'm trying to build an oil refinery, not build a, have a popularity contest. You know, and so, and, uh, and, uh, and his, other, his other remark was that as I went on with my theodolite, you know, measuring the arm, I said, Look, you know, you've got to straighten this wall here, you see. And he said, Do you know, we're trying to build an oil refinery. Not an effing watch, he said. <laughs> so, so I learned, so I learned about the art of approximation, and, uh, and uh, it was it was very interesting actually, because uh, because I was on a site as a tra engineer, I was sort of already trying to, you know, um, understand, you know, the, the maths and the science and the volumes of the stone and so on, and in relation to what these people were doing. So I I thought that was all all very interesting, and then I had a, then I also learned 
because it's a very primitive place in Northern Ireland. It still is. Though, you know, it's a very primitive sort of uh, almost sort of warlike place. Of pressures of people who come and go, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and so I had this huge black uh, black uh, uh, person carry around the theodolite and stuff with me, sort of semi escort. And when I had to, if you had to get a lot of people who just got piecework for building a brick wall, and then you tell them you've got to take it down, you're, you're, they're, you're, they're not very happy. Um, um, and um, so I would say something, and then he would say, you heard what he said. <laughs> and, and, and he said, but as he left, he said, I've got, I got one piece of advice for you, Jimmy, a really, very important. He said, if you have children, always have them by the same woman, he said, because that way you get family allowance. <laughs> Because <laughs> in the 1960s, you see, you only got family allowance for the second and subsequent children. And he said he had three children by three different women, and he was getting no family allowance. I mean, it's, that didn't come in until, uh, until the Labour government of, uh, 97, of 1974, I think. Mm. You know? it, was a, it was a very long time in coming. It didn't come in even with the first uh, uh, Wilson government. You know? Anyway, so, anyway... But the point was that if you've been that, that actually is quite a formative period before mm. you come to Trinity. Mm. It's quite different for a boy from someone who's just come from school. So, um, and, and so I had some very realistic ideas about society, you know, uh, or quite, I think, reasonably realistic society. Mm. So when I then, for example, came to Trinity, and I, you know, I was very interested in engineering, and I did that, but I quickly joined this society in Cambridge, which is extraordinary to think about called the Human Relations and Industry Group, which was, and I became the secretary and the president. This was run by the old professor, the Montague Burton Professor of Industrial Relations, which I think still thinks does it still exist. So. Mm. Uh, and um, King, Professor Kirk Holby, King's. And we used to have these amazing, so it was sort of, uh, a lot of engineers were involved in it, because in those days, it was a terrific idea. To be an engineer, you were going to be a manager. That was the thing, you know. Mm. Industry was, was this sort of semi war like zone, you know, the big problems of, of men and workers and so on. And if we how could you be an engineer unless you thought about that? So we all had these evenings in which it was amazing. We had the shop stewards from the shipyards and we had these managers and then we'd uh, and they would argue, you know, and then we'd all go back in the car together in London. But <laughs> but, uh, but that's, that's, that was a very big issue. And it, it, what happened it was quite a sudden change happened in Cambridge uh, was that um, Suddenly, management suddenly became a sort of technical business of moving money around, and mm. uh, and it became managers talking to managers. You know, mm. I mean, the only people who then introduced brought shop stewards to Cambridge after that was the Socialist Workers Party or something. You know, whereas before that, it was um, you know this was a sort of key issue, and, and, and so so that was that was one part of being an engineer in Cambridge. And, and, and we used to have these meetings, and many of the people at the meetings were mm. people reading engineering because they saw that was now the engineer are all going to go to the city or they're going to, mm. you know, the idea they've actually got to tell people what to do and get them to get along together is completely, completely, you know, very far away from their, their, their business. But, but, um, and I, so I, so that was a sort of, in some sense, Cambridge being, you know, a real world, you know, connection in Cambridge. Um, I went to the Labour Party. Despite the sort of practical seriousness of the Cold War and, um, and the Cuban Missile Crisis and so on, you know, the kind of undergraduate uh, politics was, was pure, you know, I felt. And, and was Williams, Raymond Williams, involved uh, by that time or not? Yeah, he was here. And he was here, uh, I mean, but he didn't come to meetings very much. Mm -hmm. he was writing. I read his book, Culture mm -hmm. and Society, it was a very interesting well, book. He was quite active at some point in the yes. labors of. Cause, um, Someone I've interviewed, Lisa Jardine, was very influenced by him and, and through the Labour Club and so on. That's, that's later or... Um, no, it must be about the same time. It was about the same time. Mm. I, I'm very sorry, I mean, I read his book, but mm. it seemed to be a lot of his, 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 my experience, you know, me and mm. me and my experience. As you can see, I was already, I'm afraid, concerned with, you know, what happens there. Mm. I mean, mm. what happened to me was not so important, but what happened, mm. what happened to there. And, and a lot of people in the Labour Party, it was all part of their own kind of, you know, passage, you know, of understanding themselves. And, um, 
And so I, the pro I suppose you would say I was an instrumentalist, though. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what's the problem? You know, let's deal with the problem. Um, and um, so I found that mm -hmm. uh, kind of difficult. Really. Mm -hmm. And there was a man called Williams who was very active, a little woman, sort of looking for just a direct a personal kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it, was, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't for me. Um, in fact, you know, I only got sort of really interested in this whole politics as real, real, real. Went to America as a postdoc in, in, in 1967. But I just finished. So Trinity, yes. so Trinity, I was, I was. Uh, Who were you taught by? I was taught by. Um, uh, it was a funny, it was an extraordinary old man called Mr. Binney in Trinity. He was a sort of uh, an old, old-fashioned sort of hydraulics engineer. You know, and and uh, we used to go for walks with him on Sundays over the fens and talk about the hydraulics and the draining of the fens and so on. Actually, it was even that was a very interesting thing. What very much felt we were sort of part of the fence, you know, and, and uh, talking about that. And, uh, um, and there were some other, other, I mean, they were not superstars, um, any of them, I would say. I mean, the only sort of superstar in the engineering department was this man, Baker, the head of, the head of engineering, who used to address in a sort of a traditional, I would say, sort of James Robertson justice kind of way, all the engineering undergraduates of the first day. Did, did. What you've got to remember, you can't play sport every afternoon, he said. <laughs> he was assuming we were all public school boys, and we'd all play sport every afternoon. We've got to wean ourselves from this frightful kind of addiction. <laughs> and, but um, um, he was quite the character. He built all these sort of bomb shelters in World War II. Um, and there were still sort of teachers, you know, who talked about when I was in the Western Desert and my electric motor broke down, I had to remember my first principles. So the idea was that, you know, you would be in some outlandish position, you know, mm. in the empire, on the Western Desert, mm. and you've got to remember your engineering. I mean, it was still quite looking backwards, you know. Mm. It was, it was uh, mm. I mean, it was a million miles from kind of, you know, electronics and uh, all, of, all of that. But, but the, but the marvellous thing, what I enjoyed, and then just, just to, to I wrote this article in this Trinity, in this Trinity magazine thing. Um, so we had one of my professors, Michael Shurtleff, who, who I liked very much, and I then went to become a research student with him. And he talked about these sort of really the modern ideas of connecting up you know, ga gases and magnetic fields. And uh, so, for example, which were, were, were people sort of pumping liquid sodium around nuclear reactors, you know, and it was a new sort of technology. Uh, but he's also commenting how the Americans Woodland or Moscow or whatever, but if they apply this technology as a joke, uh, they got, hadn't got it quite right. You'd just be dropping magnets on Moscow instead of bombs. <laughs> because, so, but that was quite amusing to me. You know, this mm. idea of uh, you know teaching by by humour and by lateralness. Mm. Now, in fact, I think as a as a as a, pedag as, as a subsequent teacher, it was probably a disaster because one of the things I quickly learned was that lecturers I liked almost nobody else liked, and vice versa. You know. And, um, and one of the curious things you know about lecturing, you know, that it's very bipolar. You know, mm -hmm. a class, a class can be really liked by by a third of the class and hated by two thirds of the class, or vice mm. versa. Well, I always get one or two who say these are the worst lectures I've ever <laughs> been to, and <laughs> everyone else saying they really enjoyed them. Yeah, so, well, sometimes it's more than that with me, but but uh, but anyway, I mean, I could tell that as a student. You know, that, um, but anyway, he would. I mean, this is the Christmas tree approach. You know, I thought you know, all these sort of lateral branches. Now, some people really just don't want a Christmas tree. They just want to have the sort of pole up the middle, you know, from the A to B. Um, but uh, so that was quite inspi that was inspiring, and the, and the notion that it connected up, and the, and, the, and that engineering, uh, you know, what was not a series of disciplines, but that it was a sort of tremendously in interconnected. And the other interesting thing, which uh, 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 is again unique to almost unique to, to the UK, uh, I still think, it, you know, was was the sort of being taught in the lab. I mean, so in your, in your first you know, week or two, you were in the lab, but the lecturers were in the lab there, and somehow being being taught or discussing principles while wow, huge flying wheels of air and the water was going down the flumes and so on. I mean, it was magnificent. I mean, it was kind of an experience. Where was the lab? There wasn't a camera. This was the engineering, was the engineering, yeah. the engineering yeah. department. Oh, yes. And we still had terrible old flywheel gas engines that were going back to 1905, and they were incredibly old. We they had the ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk. But it was, as teaching the principles, it was tremendous. And you had this environment, slightly oily, and the great big flywheels and noise, and, uh, and 
Oh, it was, uh, it was actually quite fun living in the Nowadays it would just be computers and... Oh, that's nothing. Yes. Uh, that's a bit of a different So, so, um, uh, no, it was, so it was quite... Uh, but how did you find the social side of Trinity? I mean, it's a very affluent and well-heeled... Well, the, the, I mean, you know, in my year, hmm. uh, there were 30 old Etonians and there were 10 old Westminsters. Um, and, um, and there were old Etonians then, as there are now, who walk around in trilby hats and gumboots, you know, as it were. And, they, and, they sort of, and it was even more funny when they came back as a Don, when they treat... I mean, a Don, I think, to a sort of posh Trinity versus, I don't know, somewhere between an under-gamekeeper and a sort of you know, floor sweeper. I don't quite know where you are. But you are definitely very low. On, and their concept of a Don, I mean, a Don. Sort of, you know, down there. <laughs> and and so, so they would... It was all amusing because they treated this place as a sort of... You know, the important thing was beetling at the weekends, mm. and they treated dons. Was as the Trinity sort of, Foot still? Oh yes, events. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So I thought they dressed up in their clothes. Uh, so that was quite uh, you know, amusing, and and they treated you as a sort of you know a kind of you know a sort of scientist, you know, this sort of you know, kind of. Uh, and we play. I played soccer with a lot of these people, you know, um, because of the, each of them, because he plays soccer, actually has mm. to mix with the Polish area. It's much more than people from some other school. Um, and so we had very sort of mixed uh, classes, and they mixed their football with some old Italians and some Church of Nottingham grammar. And, um, but um, so I, I regarded this as all part of the great pageantry of life, really. I mean, it was having this extraordinary range of, range of people. Uh, and, um, and in fact, we, it, was, it was very friendly. I mean, because I'm actually, you know, sitting there having, having a breakfast and meeting people. I met a lot of some of my closest friends were reading philosophy. And, We spent a lot of time actually in these other rooms talking and talking and talking, and um, so I and the other, and some of our films were get part. Of, you know, we used to go to the arts theatre and go to mm. film, all the sort of Italian films, and uh, uh, so I, I I really enjoyed this sort of mm. social social life uh, of, uh, of Cambridge. Um, I went on a football tour and after my first term with all these experience, sort of extraordinary mixed bag of people in Trinity soccer team, you know, from all different. I hitchhiked at the end of it, all sorts of things in a way. So I find all that, you know, it was, it was tremendously mm. exciting, really. Um, and um, uh, it's perhaps the point where I always ask people whether they feel that they, in terms of creativity, whether they feel that the collegiate system, which does mean that you're sitting next to historians and others, has had an effect on the way they think about the interconnections between things in their work. Yeah, yeah no, I think, I think, I th I mean, funnily enough, I think the collegiate system works very, very well uh, for undergraduates. I think, I think it's, it's a near disaster for many types of uh, actual academic life subsequently. Um, having moved from, uh, from Trinity to University College London, mm. I mean, I just see that as just, and having seen American universities, which obviously don't have colleges, um, I, I, I see that as having huge advantages. I mean, the, the, the curious thing about the collegiate system is that it, it's a curious thing. You have this conversation at lunch, but then people go back to their departments, and then they're in these sort of five-four silos. But in a funny way, you know, if you don't have colleges, um, you know, interdepartmental connections are, are, are stronger. There's another feature of Cambridge, which is, it, which it seems to me, is that it, it prides itself sort of tremendously on intellectual prowess and not say ownership. You know, um, whereas if you're in an empirical, not say utilitarian place like University College, you know, where you just sort of judge knowledge more by its use and its connections, you know, um, it has a very different style. So, so I, th I think, um, um, I think, you know, at some level, it's I mean, I, I felt very privileged when I went back to Trinity as a as a as a as a, as a, as a fellow because I, I was I, I was of an I was of an era when a lot of the fellows had had outside careers, E. H. Carr and his group, and, um, and uh, Vivian had, and, and many of these people obviously uh, um, uh, Otto. Um, oh, I forgot his name. I forgot the great physicist, Frisch. Frisch. He's mm. in Germany. Otto. 
true, true. So, so the colleges uh, were fantastic because they were actually, they came from all sorts of different walks. And I think, uh, my, uh, my view, I'm afraid, is that Cambridge's recruitment policy has been quite narrow. And um, progressively, I think the colleges have become far too sort of inward and, mm. uh, and uh, I think disappointing in that in many ways. And I think Cambridge's position in the world you know, might, not, might not be, I mean, I think its high reputation might be perhaps based on past glories. And um, 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 so uh, it, it, unless, unless there's a very, very firm, uh, very, very firm policy in the colleges and universities to keep recruiting people who have experiences outside, um, you know, it's a system that becomes too cosy at the, at the top level. But as, as that for undergraduates, I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. And, but then I saw this extraordinary check. But it was very insular. I mean, that was mm -hmm. the point. Very English, um, very male. You know, at that time, uh, there were no girls in Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, so I met a young Italian girl, um, courtesy of some boys in Chelsea Kings, and. Uh, a pretty, pretty male life, really. um, and uh, on Friday, you know, Fridays or Saturdays at the train station, we just saw all these girls coming down, and <laughs> it was a bit of a strange, uh, sort of, uh, strange kind of life, actually. But then I became a, um, um, so, you know, I was studying, and I, and I spent, uh, during that time, I, I did sort of traveling in Europe, and I became more and more, sort of enjoyed Europe, mm -hmm. and, as I say, as, as a schoolboy. Switch, which I sort of enjoyed going to, mm. to Europe and travel all over. And, and traveling to Germany, particularly, which nowadays young people hardly ever go to Germany. Mm. It's quite, quite strange. And um, and then um, then I had this sort of you know decision what to do, uh, what to do when, when I finished. Um, so um, one option, you know, was to do, which is what I was thinking of to start with. Uh, in fact, I went a long way down the road was to train to become a civil engineer because. One of my vacations, I went to Pakistan when my father was a, uh, was a, again, a, a diplomat. And uh, I, I saw these extraordinary large schemes of dams and irrigation and, uh, and the need for that, those kind of things. And I thought that's what my career was going to be. So I thought I was going to go to America and, and, and learn about that and, uh, and have a career as a civil engineer. But I met my wife and, uh, and uh, you know, she couldn't have gone there. And so I decided to switch. And be a research student in Cambridge. Um, and I was very pleased about that decision. And um, so I did that with my, my supervisor, Shercliffe, in this world, the new technology of mag magnetic fields, and, which people thought was going to be a new way of improving the efficiency of power stations. You know, you use very hot gases, and you push them through a magnetic field before, before they then ran a boiler to turn paper turbines. But it, I mean, it was a very exciting sort of period of big sort of huge lot of money to spend experiments and I, I had a sort of industrial uh, scholarship to pay for while I was doing my, my PhD on this sort of subject. Um, and, um, but in doing so there was a sort of new mathematics to be done and that was interesting. So I, I started that um, and uh, then after one year my professor then got this job as being head of engineering in, in, in Warwick. Warwick. So uh, it's very funny. Trinity, Trinity, all the Trinity High School. You're leaving Cambridge. You're, new, you're throwing your Cambridge career. Oh, dear, dear. Anyway, um, so I went to Warwick. Uh, it, it was very, you know, mm. it, it, it bothers me. We got married. I got married, and we lived in a Tudor cottage in you know, Castle. And I worked in a, an aircraft factory. There was, no, there was no university. So once again, I was back to the sort of, you know. <laughs> we did all these experiments in, in the part of the Bristol Sydney Aircraft Factory in downtown Coventry. And my wife, um, who designed uh, textile design, she was the, mis the wardrobe mistress in the Belgrade Theatre, which is a very progressive theatre in, in, the, in the 60s. Um, but they put all these plays, and so she and, and I met them, these famous actors. You know, uh, and, um, and can you imagine, this was the 60s, so, so uh, on these, on these, uh, 
Whereas in London in the 60s, all the theatres were about uh, kind of who's the tennis of the game through the, through mm. the kind of, you know, the doors and the drawing room and so on, the system and the court and so on. <laughs> in Coventry, you know, they were doing, you know, uh, they were doing uh, Arnold Wesco and, uh, and, and classical mm. things and so on. But then at the end of the theatre, the, the, the first night of the theatre, you'd have a conversation between the audience, you know, and the, and the, and the actors and the directors mm. and so on, sort of public discussion and so on. It was amazing, you know. And um, on one famous occasion, uh, well, to me, was that, uh, was that the Minister of Culture, Jenny Lee, came and chaired the discussion at the end of Lock Up Your Daughters, which was a great production. My wife had done all the stage. And, 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 um, and then the Guardian, the next thing, Guardian described it, then described the discussion afterwards and said at the end of this discussion, a man in a duffel coat stopped at the back of the room and asked some questions. And that was me, but I, I forgot what the question was. But anyway, anyway. in fact, <laughs> yeah, in fact, this, is, this even appears in Jenny Lee's biography. I think this anonymous go question a duffel coat. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a penetrating question. <laughs> so it was. Um, and can you imagine? And I used to come back in the evenings after after uh, after having supper with my wife at the terrible, terrible kind of civic canteen in Coventry, and so we'd go to my lab. And I'd go past the police station, who periodically would ask me to appear on an identity parade. <laughs> the prince. So I sort of saw life. Um, so I didn't, it was interesting, um, you know, I didn't skirt around these things, mm. and I sort of, enjoy, I sort of appreciated it. Mm. So I've sort of been interested in you know, society from top to bottom. Mm. So, so when I, um, anyway, so then I did, did a PhD, and, and, uh, and it was very exciting. Uh, it was very new science, and I, and I gave seminars on, on what I'd done all around the place. Um, I went, and it was very, very interesting. Uh, to have, you know, I think science works. So I gave a seminar, for example, uh, at, at University College after my first four terms, and they were very excited about this maths and so on. And people made suggestions about how it should be improved. You know. So I said, terrific. So I quickly started writing these joint papers. With, you know, I said, by the time I finished my PhD, I've written joint papers with about five or six professors you know, who sort of got my ideas and made other suggestions and so on. So I quickly sort of, because as you, I think you can see, I was a sort of social person. I see my life was all to do with interaction with people. And so science was another kind of way in which you, know, you could make progress faster by doing it with, with other people. And uh, so I made, I think, it a lot, you know, for a PhD student, did quite a lot in that time. And the other amusing thing was, that, again, is that you'd rather like going to wild things and getting into a row. Um, so, <laughs> so this was a new part of my contrarian mm -hmm. life, was then to go and visit these various professors and say, excuse me, but don't you think this was a mistake? And they said, mm -hmm. I think you're right about that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, uh, so that, you know, that was quite, quite part of it, made my sort of name. You know. mm -hmm. um, there are people who know to make their name in science because they deliberately say, I'm going to find an error in X. Mm -hmm. you know, So I then, um, because I had a, tri a, 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 a Trinity, well, it was BA, I could have I could put in for Trinity Fellowship, so I, then I put in for my Trinity Fellowship, which is quite a thing, you know, you have whatever it is, 20, 20 25 DC, something four. You know, mm. quite a, quite a it is, it's very stiff. So it's quite Maitland didn't get one. <laughs> is that? F.W. Maitland, my hero. Um, anyway, so I, I, um, I got that, it was very nice, Rad Butler. Of the work of Dr. Hunt, we shall soon be able to reduce the electricity bill in Trinity College. <laughs> that, was, that was a bit optimistic. <laughs> but uh, but um, so then I, um, I, you know, I had, I had a sort of interesting sort of spell in tra tra traveling. I went to South Africa, South Africa, South Africa, with my wife, and it was a visiting lecturer in South Africa for, for about three months. And, uh, and, then, and then we went to America. Six, I was on a Fulbright scholarship, and that was also extremely sort of, um, influential in my, in my uh, sort of life, really. Um, partly because you know it's, it was some interesting, interesting scientific work, and I sort of made American, American connections. But um, you know, we were there in, in '67, which was mm. which was the which was the year of. 
one evening we um, was in the front of New York and we drove back from Long Island and we sort of turned right and we got onto Manhattan and, and not knowing that we could go from the Lower East Side to the Upper West Side. You don't normally drive through Harlem, which we followed in system, you thought you might use it. Anyway, this was in the middle of a riot and, uh, and uh, with a burning, burning you know, flourish of you know, people on the side of the throwing bottles and so on. So there we are in our car, driving, driving through this. And um, anyway, we just said, well, we'll just keep driving. Actually, we got through, we got through all right. But, I mean, but we saw, you know, we saw, we saw what we saw. And, um, and later that, that my, what I was sort of doing research, my wife worked in the anti-Vietnam War movement. What was absolutely fascinating was the anti-Vietnam War movement was run more efficiently than any bridging industry I had ever seen to that date. I mean, it was, you know, the Americans, the extraordinary thing about Americans is that they, they, they decide on, on a group activity, or they used to do, and, they, and then they stop talking about it, and they keep on doing it. Whereas in any British voluntary group, they keep talking about the, what the voluntary group is doing all the time, and therefore it's very, very boring to get down to, 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 to reality. The Americans quickly get over the objectives and down to the, you know, delivery, you know, and uh, so they are very effective at these kind of campaigns, and so we, to be with those million people, you know, marching on the Pentagon, you know, in, 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 which Norman Mailer described in Armies of the Night, so mm -hmm. we were there, just, you know, a little bit behind Norman Mailer, you know, it was just, just an extraordinary experience. The only time I leave the Pentagon is over the back gate, all the way, even though I've, I, I, I've, uh, I've never been through the front door, but I, <laughs> I have been over the back fence. <laughs> But apparently, I say it's Americans. I say there lots of people like you. They say <laughs> so. Terrorists, so it was, we call them. What terrorists? We call them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's, it's, uh, but it was historically, you know, you had the, the American soldiers. You know, were formed up in squares. You know, mm. and, and people were literally putting you know, flowers in their in their, mm. in their guns and so on. But um, but it was it was very sort of interesting. Uh, you know, being buzzed by helicopters, and then the next day, the CBS was saying, you know, to the cries of encouragement. But driving down to, to Washington from New York, the, the highway was completely full. I mean, it was bumper to tail, four lanes. It was just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Um, and, uh, and then we were by the reflecting pool and uh, you know, all these sort of speakers and marching over the, over the bridge, the uh, Arlington Bridge. It was, it was uh, really quite a, quite a, an event, really. And um, so was that. Uh, so when I... Um, and, and, and I had to, I had to say that... I, Joined the Peter's Brothers of, of, of that year. We were in Africa, and, and uh, well, then I were on a bus in, in, in Africa. And my father was uh, my father. My father was uh, also part of this sort of you know, end, of, end of empire scenario. So this is when the uh, uh, Ugandan army you know, went out of control. And, uh, we were in a bus which was taken over by the Ugandan army, which is quite uh, quite an army really. Um, but actually, it turned out to be a good thing because if you were taken over by the one bit of the army, then we hit a roadblock by another bit of the army. You went through the roadblock, you know, <laughs> as if you had just been with, without the army on board. But they were very frightening, and uh, and you could see uh, the timidity and, uh, and so on. And uh, so I've been quite a few inadvertently, you know, events like this, and, and uh, you know, you see the power and the and the um, the way in which humans suddenly moving from an orderly way into a very disorderly. And therefore, I suppose from that point of view, I'm, I'm a sort of, a, I incline towards the authoritarian. I mean, I, I, you know, keeping, you know, keep society can blow, I mean, I start from the school that societies are dangerous things, hmm. terrific powers in society, and they can go off course, and therefore you've got to be precautious about this. Whereas there are, you could say, e extreme libertarians whose first thing is what happens if Mr. X gets put in prison for the wrong reason. Hmm. If that's your entire objective, you know, you're in danger of, of losing, losing other things, so, and that's obviously the permanent debate in politics, so I, my personal experiences have been that people want to be in an ordered situation, uh, and they're very frightened, very, very frightened when it gets out of control, um, and so you must be very careful about that. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I think people, some of the people think of me as an anarchistic person, but I'm not an anarchistic person. Uh, I've been head of the School of Dragons, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> And, uh, you believe in authority. I believe in, I believe in keeping things on, on the, you know, within a dragon spirit, you know, as a means of sort of, you know, uh, minimum.